Tēnā koutou katoa, no mai, haere mai, and welcome to today's webinar, Exploring the Safer Online Services and Media Platforms Consultation. My name is Charlotte Moore, I'm the kaiwhakahaere for the New Zealand Family Violence Clearinghouse, and it is my pleasure to be hosting our webinar today. Before I introduce our speakers, I will just run through some housekeeping for our webinar. In a webinar, as attendees, your microphones and cameras are off. No one can see or hear you. You can use the Q&A box uh, for questions for our speakers. They will answer your questions at the end, but you can ask questions at any time and we encourage you to do so. We have disabled the chat function in this webinar. We are using the Zoom automatic closed caption service. You can turn this on by clicking the CC button on your screen. Please note that if we consider any comments or behavior to be disrespectful or offensive, we reserve the right to remove people from the webinar at our discretion. We do not allow attendees to record or stream our webinars in any way. By attending or watching this webinar, you agree that you will not save, record, share or post the session or any portion of the session, including screenshots, audio recording, video recording, screen sharing or screen recording. Our NZFB staff member Megan Setti is in the background, uh, helping manage the tech issues and moderating the Q&A. We understand that the issues we'll discuss today can be challenging or triggering. You can mute the sound or leave the webinar at any time. I also want to acknowledge that many of you when registering for this webinar asked about the supports and resources to help victims. This webinar is focused on the policy issues raised in the consultation. We will not be discussing information specific to help for online harm, but we will provide a list of where to go for help at the end of the webinar. This webinar was prompted by the public consultation from Te Tari Taifenua, Department of Internal Affairs, or DIA. DIA is proposing changes to the way media and online platforms are regulated in New Zealand, with a focus on keeping people safe online. It's called the Safer Online Services and Media Platforms. You may hear some people call this SOSM for short. Our current system is more than 30 years old and online platforms are not currently regulated in New Zealand. As many of you know, harmful online content affects nearly everyone who uses the internet in some way. But some people experience harm more often and much greater harm, including children and young people, women, Māori, Pasifika, Muslim and other faith communities, LGBTQIA plus people and disabled people and many other communities. There are many ways that online content can cause harm, either for individuals or communities. This can include bullying, harassment, threats, discrimination and hate speech, disinformation and misinformation, exploitation and many forms of violence, including image-based uh, abuse is just one example. We know that misogynistic abuse and violent threats against women in Aotearoa is a significant issue. This is particularly so for wahine Māori and women with intersectional identities. Research shows that online violence is linked with violence in real life. This includes links between online misogyny and gender-based violence such as intimate partner violence, sexual violence and abuse of older people as well as child abuse and exploitation. SOSIMP or the DIA consultation is focused on regulating platforms. Platforms are providers of content and services like social media platforms such as Facebook, YouTube and Twitter and traditional media platforms like radio and television. The consultation document proposes a new way to regulate content providers under one regulatory framework. Our regulatory legislation, including the Films, Videos and Publications, the Classifications Act 1993 and the Broadcasting Act 1989, is over 30 years old. It does not cover the range of harms people experience across online services and media platforms. There are four key parts to the proposed changes. An industry regulation model that uses codes of practice, an independent regulator, continuing to remove and block access to the most harmful content, and investment in education and awareness. As many of you know, there are significant challenges and gaps within our current system for addressing online harmful content. Uh, Anjum Raman is the founder and project co-lead of Inclusive Aotearoa 
collective Tahono, whose mission is to build a social movement across the country of people, organisations and communities committed to working together to build a socially inclusive Aotearoa New Zealand. Inclusive Aotearoa Collective Tahono is part of the Coalition for Better Digital Policy, working to improve New Zealand's voluntary code of practice for online safety and harms. Anjum was a founding member of the Islamic Women's Council of New Zealand and a founding member and trustee of Sharma Ethnic Women's Trust. She has worked in the area of sexual violence prevention, both as a volunteer and as part of government working groups. She is also a member of the international of international committees dealing with violent extremist content online, being the co-chair of the Christchurch Call Advisory Network, and a member of the Independent Advisory Com Advisory Committee of the Global Internet Forum for Countering Terrorism. She is also a council member of Internet New Zealand. Welcome, Anjum. Kate Hanna is the Director of the Disinformation Project and a PhD candidate in the Centre for Science and Society at Te Hiringa Waka, Victoria University of Wellington. Her research interests include gender, race, eugenics, colonisation and white supremacism in historic and contemporary science and technology cultures and subcultures. Hannah is one of two New Zealand representatives on the Global Partnership on Artificial Intelligence, GPAI, Responsible AI Working Group, and is leading a research project developing principles for community consultation on classification and mitigation of online harm for GPAI. Finally, Jo Robertson is the research and training lead for the LIGHT project, which provides information and resources for youth, families, and professionals to navigate the new porn landscape. Jo has a master, Master's of Science in Medicine specialising in sex therapy with a focus on international consumption rates and impacts on, of porn on adolescents. She has had 15 years experience working in sexual health and trauma through education and counselling. Jo has a private therapeutic practice specialising in problematic sexual behaviours, sexual dysfunction and relationship breakdown. She has recently co-founded the campaign Makes Sense, which is lobbying for the removal of illegal sexual con content online, and she has given a TEDx talk titled Why We Need to Talk About Porn. A big welcome to all of our panellists today. Uh, we're going to start off with some questions for our panellists, uh, and we're going to start with Anjum. Anjum, could you talk about the scope and origin of the problem from a global perspective? Tina Kaito Katoa, he uritine no India, ko Kiriki Roa, Toku Fatimanoa, ko Waikato Te Awa Imahia Nei Aku Maharahara, ke Kiriki Roa, Ahu Enoho Ana Inai Nei, ko Andrew Rahman Te Toku Ingoa Nori, ra Tina Kaito Katoa. Thank you, and it's um, a pleasure to be here. I'm just going to put up a PowerPoint, and I apologise for this PowerPoint is not as pretty and um, as I would like it to be, and it has a lot of words, um, and I haven't been able to caption the images, but what I can say is that I've got links for um, so that you can go back to the sources and find all the wording and read up on, on the things that I'm saying. Um, so I wanted to start with a global sort of scoping exercise. Um, and apologies that you won't get to read all the words on every slide, but don't worry about that. You can you can read them later. Um, we'll make sure this is sent out to you. Um, so globally, we're looking at basically state campaigns around online hate, around mis and disinformation, um, and those kinds of things. And so this is just um, some information based on the disinformation campaign around Ukraine um, and how sophisticated they are. So they're impeding, um, you know, they're impersonating media websites, government websites. Um, they're seeding um, this disinformation and we're finding that mainstream media are picking them up and reporting it as if it was real. So even the, the mainstream media is not picking some of this stuff. Um, I had the privilege to go to Costa Rica in June and um, attend RightsCon, which is a human rights convention, and heard firsthand speakers speak about the disinformation campaign that is happening around chemical warfare in Syria. And the, these people talked about 
the effort it took to collect the evidence about chemical weapons being used, how they had to train first responders, how they had to keep the chain of evidence to make sure that the evidence wasn't contaminated, how they couldn't send the evidence online but had to travel to the border to Jordan to hand over to investigators. Um, and then what they're facing is all these bulk bots and troll campaigns um, saying that that stuff never happened and that a lot of people believing that there were no chemical weapons used and how harmful it was to them, almost as harmful as the attacks themselves. Um, we know, you know, in a global sense as well, that governments are using troll armies. And so um, here, you know, name India is very famous for their troll army, and um, this this article has named China, Brazil, Russia, and the United States, but I can assure you there are more governments than that. Um, and so these trolls are people that are paid, um, which means that if you're going to try and debate with them or try and persuade them to an alternative point of view, that will never happen. They're not there to be persuaded. They're there to push a particular agenda. And as end users, we don't know you know, we're not aware of who's a troll and who isn't, but this is massive online. Um, again, in the COVID disinformation space, we have governments involved. Um, not only governments, but we also have um, people within society. And this report around the disinformation does them, I would highly recommend. Um, and what it's showing us is that a few people can create the impression that a whole lot of people believe this stuff. Um, and that really has an impact because people believe it more if they hear it a lot. And so we see these people having multiple accounts on multiple social media platforms to ensure that they're getting the reach um, and creating that impression of, of um, size that really isn't there. Um, we then also had the whole conspiracy theory space and QAnon that is feeding into um, online harm, online hate, um, extremism. Um, and then I'm going to refer you to the Royal Commission report on the terrorist attacks on, Christ, on uh, the Christchurch Mustard Dan. Um, they've done some really good stuff around outlining how um, right-wing extremists are using the internet. Um, and that this, this idea that we have these lone, lone actor extremists isn't you know, correct, because they are very, very often um, connected into spaces online. And what we're seeing is that the organizing in, on not the main, main platforms at the moment, um, it's kind of Telegram and various other spaces, they've been using Discord channels and so on, organizing there and then hitting in a coordinated way the more mainstream platforms. Um, gaming platforms, also are um, increasingly, or have been used for quite a while, but it's been noticed a lot more recently, the way that gaming platforms um, are being used to radicalize and reach young people. So the reason that I wanted to bring that, all of this to you is because we often treat the problem as if it's individuals sitting in their basements, um, you know, just being little trolls online. And sure, there are plenty of those. They are, but um, but the scope of this is that it is organized, it is well resourced and funded, it is deliberate. They fully understand how platforms work, but where the boundaries are. They continue to test those boundaries so that they're staying on the right side of them. Um, they're using the latest scientific knowledge about how our minds work and how we can be manipulated online. This is not organic. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Kia ora, Anjum. Um, yeah, lots. there's going to be a lot to think about with this particular consultation and, and the relationship between small platforms and the larger platforms in terms of what is regulated and what isn't, I think will be really critical as well. Uh, I'm not sure that this webinar is going to get any more cheerful as we go, uh, but uh, we can hope that it is a call to action um, in terms of encouraging everybody out there to submit because the legislation is um, is a really important first step into addressing some 
um, of these harms. Um, I'm going to go a little bit rogue on our uh, outline for this webinar and combine um, a couple of sections of questions. Um, so aroha mai to my panellists. Um, but I think we've already really kind of established that the impacts and experiences are not distributed equally in terms of online harm, in terms of who was targeted, what those impacts are. Um, Anjum, you've been involved, obviously, in a range of work in this area, um, particularly in terms of co-founding Inclusive Aotearoa, the Christchurch call work that you've been involved in, um, and other pieces of really important work. I'm wondering if you could talk about the impacts um, that you have noticed through your work um, in particular, but also then could you sort of move on and talk a little bit about whether you think the... Um, the proposed responses within the discussion document are likely to be adequate in addressing those impacts and concerns? Sure, thanks um, Charlotte. I'm going to just go back to my screen and presentation. Um, just... Oops. We'll go back. I just wanted to put this up just to give a sense of the range of things that we're talking about. This is again from the link I had to the Royal Commission report, um, but there's lots of different places you can go to get this. So it starts, you know, at the at the low end, um, and the Royal Commission, of course, was dealing with the Christchurch mosque attack, so that's why it's framed in this way. Um, and then it can move on to more um, sustained harassment. Um, then we get the coordinated campaigns um, and so on. And then we get the actual violence. Um, and so um, I'll, I'll flick over this. I just, again, looking at the international level, that, you know, what we're talking about is, you know, fatal. It is effectively fatal in many, many ways. Um, so we're not just talking about someone getting offended and having their feelings hurt. And so this is one of the um, strategic legislation uh, lawsuits that is taking place at the moment. Um, Facebook already uh, admitted their culpability here, so it'll be interesting to see how they go with compensation. Um, <clears throat> What's happening in Tigray, again at RightsCon, we got to hear directly um, from people in Kenya where the, this case um, is taking place and the impact and the way that the words online, um, content warning, this person, his father was shot to death um, for months, the, these posts doxing him and using language about him, and as the killers were watching him bleed to death. They were taunting him with the very words that were used on those Facebook posts. And that's what this case is about and trying to get some level of responsibility and liability and compensation there. Um, uh, this is from Family Violence Clearinghouse, um, but that UN report I think is really worth reading. And again, the fact that, you know, if you're ethnic, indigenous, um, you know, uh, rainbow, that these impacts are really higher and they're really impacting women's participation in politics and leadership and generally in society. Um, so, oops, let me, that's the end of the presentation. Um, so even within Aotearoa, we're seeing both that what happens uh, offline is shaping what happens online. Also what happens online is leading to more harassment um, and abuse offline. And the police are now starting to collect those stats around hate crimes um, and what that means. In terms of the code, um, or the, sorry, in terms of the consultation documents, I'll quickly go through various points. What I think is good is having a single regulator that is independent from government. I think that is critical, um, that there is no state or political interference around these issues. Um, I think it's really good that the regulator would be looking at systemic issues and not just individual posts. Um, mm -hmm because these are systemic problems that built into the code of these platforms are built into the algorithms and the machine learning and the recommender algorithms and the content moderation algorithms and so on. Um, what is really problematic for me, one, is the number of codes because one of the 
points of this thing was to simplify for the general public um, the process of making complaints. But this will not, if you want to complain about media content, online content, so on, there still will be a whole lot of different codes. Um, what really worries me is the community involvement in developing the codes and that it is highly industry based and while the proposal is requiring consultation that is not co-design it is not giving power to communities um, and it, one of the issues that we have and we're seeing particularly over the last year is that extremists are really jumping into the space of government consultations and hijacking that space. Um, they're exploiting it. They are right in there. And so it is really important to embed that the voices of those impacted by harm are the voices that need to have prominence. Um, Someone in the Q and A's talked about tetirity. All they have covered within the tetirity space is the participation part, the consultation part, and that is not what tetirity is about. And so it is about shared decision making. It is about um, shared power, and none of that is reflected in in the consultation document at all. Um, and what's missing is the justice system, like people's experiences of making complaints and receiving effective remedy isn't there. Um, so even because they're not dealing with individual posts, we can tell you, um, many, each of us can tell you from lived experience how those systems are not working for people that are experiencing online harm and they really aren't. And none of this deals with that in any effective way whatsoever. Um, so I'll stop there because um, I know my other panelists have plenty of good things to say. Kia ora, Anjum. Some really good points there. Um, and I just, I really want to emphasize the beautiful comment you made uh, that the voices of those impacted by harm are the voices that absolutely need to be heard. And I think this is kind of really why we've pulled this webinar together today to counter what we know will be a lot of submissions from people who are going to talk a lot about freedom of speech, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so our communities, uh, people we know um, are impacted. Absolutely, we need to bring those voices to the forefront of, of these conversations. So thank you. Kia thank you, Kate. Um, we are kind of running out of time a little bit. Um, I am um, going to summarise, I think there are a lot of gaps that you have already as panellists identified for us. Um, Tetirity is a critical one. It, the documents are very vague about what role Māori will have in terms of decision making um, as this consultation progresses uh, and what role they will have in terms of, of I guess, you know, those governance issues. Um, given how uh, impacted uh, Māori are, but as tangata whenua, um, what is their role in this piece of work? I think also the binary nature of, of kind of what is legal, what is illegal, um, I think is also really critical and the blurred lines actually in reality in terms of um, how far you can take something that is legal and how much harm that can actually um, be causing as well. Uh, and also that need to, to find out and understand really how do we make sure that this is victim survivor centered, that the people who are experiencing the greatest levels of harm uh, have the greatest ability to have that, um, that harm mitigated wherever possible and to have decent penalties and decent teeth in terms of legislation. Finally, I think um, you raised the Harmful Digital Communications Act, and I think it's really um, a, a huge gap because the success of regulation uh, is reliant on other frameworks and legislation, including the Harmful Digital Communications Act, and that is largely absent in terms of this consultation document from what we can see. So I think that's a clear, that, that legislation is um, very much in need of, of addressing um, and updating in terms of whether it's fit for purpose currently. Um, just a couple of questions we'll have time for, and aroha mai, um, we won't get to everything. Um, so, and, and please do feel free to contact us after the webinar if there are things that you still have questions around. Um, 
I think there's a question here around are the panelists concerned about the proposal for industry led regulation and are there better models for regulatory design? How do they consider rights holders, particularly women, LGBTQI, disabled ethnic minorities, um, can have their interests included in industry design regulation? Pop that one out um, for the panelists. Anjum's got her hand up. Anjum. Yeah, I mean, because I put my hand up because we've been part of a group that has been engaging first with NetSafe and then NZ Tech around the voluntary code that was put up by Online Harm. And one of our most significant concerns about that code was that it was designed by the MAGE platforms in conjunction with NetSafe. Um, and we asked for them to go back and start again and design it with communities and particularly those impacted communities. Um, our experience of um, trying to get change to that code has been one of pretty much being ignored and no significant changes happening. Um, and that has been really troublesome. And that is why I feel that this consultation report places way too much um, power in the hands of industry to develop those codes and not enough of those people that are having to deal with both the, the psychological and physical harm, you know, because as I've showed, it leads to physical harm, um, but also having the experience of trying to seek remedy. Um, and there's not really effective remedy there either because we know finding we um, these big websites doesn't work um, and so we you know there needs to be more consideration around what is effective remedy therefore what I'm saying is you need a co-design process you need to put impacted communities at the heart and center of that process um, and they also need to be within the regulator and, and, and heart and center of the enforcement process as well. Because what we're finding is a lack of diversity within platforms, um, including mainstream media platforms, means that the people that are in there are not experiencing and understanding some of them. Um, obviously, many women gen journalists and rainbow community journalists and disabled are facing that but there are not enough of them in there. So we need more um, diversity within the regulator and within um, the platforms to make sure that those lived experiences are right front and center at, at all phases. Kia ora, ngā mahi nui kia koutou and aroha mai that um, we have come up to the end of our time together. Um, I just really want to say a huge thank you to all of our panelists today um, for joining us on what is a really important topic. There's a lot to discuss. Um, I think there's you know a lot to really think through. Um, but as I think it was Kate or well, someone mentioned, you don't have to answer every question in the DIA discussion document. Um, it's really critical that you submit on the things that you think are important to you, that you give the feedback that reflects your concerns and experience, um, because your voices are really critical in this process. You do have until the 30th of July to put your submission in, um, and we really encourage you um, to do what you can. We have information through our news story on the NZFEC website about um, this piece of consultation, and we'll be updating that with further resources um, to support submissions um, as we go through. At the end of this webinar, you'll also get a link to our very quick five question survey. We really would love it if you would um, please fill that out. There is a question there where you can share feedback from your work um, or community that we can include in our submission. Um, please don't share personal or confidential um, identifying information with that. If you or a client that you work with uh, needs help, uh, you should see a slide on your screen shortly with options of who to contact for help. Um, but finally, just want to um, say a huge thank you um, to Jo, Kate and Anjum um, to wish everybody a safe uh, week in the weeks ahead. Uh, and we um, hope that this will be the start of ongoing conversations about how we can navigate better in this online space. Um, so kia ora koutou. Ka kite.